so this is part three of our three-part video series on topics relating to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. The first two parts focused on the virology and the epidemiology portion. Now this last part is going to focus on the immunology side of things or the study of the immune system. Just as a reminder, one, all of these videos were shot towards the end of March. So once again, keep that in mind. But then the second thing is that nobody in this video works with SARS-CoV-2. However, everybody in this video studies topics that are important to understand for what's going on in the world today. So with that in mind, a friend of mine, Cybelle, who is a fantastic science communicator, agreed to give a short introduction on how the immune system can handle something like a viral infection. So with that, Cybelle, go ahead and take it away. Hi, my name is Cybelle Tavilas, and I'm a graduate student studying immunology and infectious diseases at Cornell University. In this video, I'm going to talk about what our body does when we are infected with a virus such as the novel coronavirus COVID-19. To address this question, we first have to understand what the immune system is. The immune system is composed of a variety of cell types colloquially called white blood cells. And the role of white blood cells is to patrol the body and look for foreign invaders or non-self. And it's important to note that when an immunologist like myself refers to something as foreign, we are referring to something that comes from outside of our body. We are not referring to where the virus or other type of pathogen originated from. When an immune cell called a dendritic cell comes into contact with a virus, it eats it up and chops it into a bunch of smaller pieces called antigen. The dendritic cell then has a very important job to travel to the closest lymph node and figure out what immune cell it's going to talk to next. Because the virus is an intracellular pathogen, the dendritic cell needs to find a very specialized type of immune cell called the CD T cell and show the antigen to that CD T cell. CD T cells or killer T cells are a very unique cell type within our immune system. Killer T cells were raised to recognize a very specific type of antigen from a pathogen. So once a dendritic cell shows a killer T cell the antigen from the coronavirus, it then is able to activate the CD8 T cell. Once a CD8 T cell becomes activated, it begins to create clones of itself, and each individual CD8 T cell is able to create about 20 clones of itself. And this is really important because the more clones we have against the virus, such as coronavirus, this means that the body will be able to mount an even stronger immune response, which in turn means that there is a higher probability of eradicating that virus from the body. After the killer T cell creates clones of itself, it then travels from the lymph node to the site of infection. And in the case of coronavirus, the site of infection is the lower respiratory tract. Once a killer T cell comes into contact with a infected cell, it will then kill those cells. Another important cell type within our immune system that is critical for fighting a viral infection such as coronavirus is a B cell. Like T cells, B cells were developed and raised for a very specific type of pathogen. Once another type of immune cell called a helper T cell activates a B cell, the B cell is then able to undergo a series of mutations. And these mutations are actually very beneficial for the immune system because it allows the B cell to become more specific for whatever pathogen such as the coronavirus that it is fighting. B cells can then differentiate into another cell type called plasma cells. And each plasma cell is able to secrete about 10,000 antibodies per second. And the mechanism of action for these antibodies is that they're able to bind to the surface of a virus, which prevents them from infecting any other cells. Additionally, other types of antibodies can also bind to the surface of a virus and tag it for degradation by other immune cell types. So our body has a large arsenal of weapons to protect ourselves against disease, and the most specialized weapons against disease are cells of our immune system. However, the process that I described is taking into account what is going to happen in a healthy individual. However, individuals who are immune compromised or the elderly may not be able to mount as quick of a response or as strong of a response against infection, meaning that it's harder for their body to eradicate and fight the infection. Thank you, Cybelle, for taking the time to record that. Once again, 
really appreciate it. Moving right along, um, we're going to move to our last Q&A session with Dr. Cindy Leifer, who is an immunologist here at Cornell. For those of you who don't know, she is an absolutely phenomenal science communicator. She does an excellent job taking very complex topics in immunology and distilling them in a way that people without a background in immunology can understand. Talking to her was a fantastic conversation. So without further ado, please welcome our final speaker, Dr. Cindy Leifert. So Cybelle basically just gave her background information on the immune system, and I was hoping you could introduce yourself and kind of say your name, your department, and your university affiliation. I'm Professor Cindy Leifer I'm at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Cornell University, and I'm an immunologist. All right. So we have a handful of questions for you. I was just hoping if you could uh, get us started by talking a little bit about one of the questions we got is, if you get the virus and you recover... Do you have to worry about getting it again or are you immune? I know a lot of people are worried about this. For most infections, once you are infected and your body responds to that, your immune system mobilizes all its T cells and B cells and all these other uh, components of the immune system, they develop what's called memory. And this is really, really important because the, the your body remembers that you saw this infection before. And so if you see it again, you can respond really fast and you don't end up getting sick. So the big question is with this coronavirus, does that happen? And so there's evidence for and against, so we don't absolutely know that we just started, we saw the first case of this in the world in November or December of 2019. So it's difficult to know right now whether humans are perfectly immune and whether or not they'll be infected again. But we have a lot of evidence to suggest that might be the case. They've tested a, a bunch of different people in Hong Kong once they were infected to see whether they developed what are called antibodies. And antibodies are an important protective mechanism. Once your body responds, they produce antibodies. And if there's reasonable levels of antibodies, those can bind up the virus if you get exposed again and prevent you from getting infected. And so individuals do develop potent antibody responses and they're capable of preventing the virus from infecting cells. But um, whether they remain long-term, we don't know. With SARS and MERS, which are two similar coronaviruses that have infected over the last 10 or 20 years, there's some evidence to suggest that the antibody responses do go down after a couple of years. But uh, there's not too many people that get reinfected with, reinfected with those, so we don't really know for sure. Where one other positive thing that's come out in the past couple of months is they did a monkey study with rhesus macaques. Now, it was only a few animals, but they infected them. They made sure they had cleared the infection. There was no virus. They mounted antibody responses, and when they challenged them again, they didn't get infected. So, again, we don't know for sure for humans, but... Evidence suggests that that will happen. And the most important thing is that once we have a vaccine, then hopefully people will have these protective responses and they won't get sick when, when this circulates again. So cool. Uh, I don't know. I, I love learning more about this stuff. Uh, <laughs> the immune system is just absolutely fascinating how it works. It's so many different intricate pieces that work together and it's really a web, right? It's people like linear things. They like A leads to B, leads to C, leads to D. But in the immune system, it's just like A leads to everything else and it just explodes from there and it's really awesome. Um, so you kind of touched on it about this, but one of the other questions we had was how are vaccines made? People are seeing in articles that people are estimating about one to one and a half years for a vaccine to be made. What goes into that process and why does it take so long? So people are really excited for vaccines and they think a year and a half sounds like a really long time, right? But in reality is normally to develop a vaccine can take 10 years to several decades. So the fact that we are talking about this kind of timeline is just astounding. But why can't we do it tomorrow? The reason why is, so first, there are several ways to make a vaccine, and we need to know which way works best. So if we talk about something like influenza that circulates every year, we have a pretty standard protocol for how we design the vaccine for that. And what we do is just substitute in from year to year what strain we think will circulate. And what they do is they grow that in large quantities and inactivate it and bottle it up and give it out. And so it's pretty reasonably fast timeline to develop that six to nine months, but we have to know what virus to target for that. And flu constantly changes. So that's one way to make a vaccine. Another way to make a vaccine is what we call a live attenuated vaccine. That just means that it's an actual 
pathogen or a virus that can infect but does a really crappy job. And so it tricks our immune system into thinking we're infected with something really bad and our immune system generates a response. So a a vaccine like this is, for example, measles. And so they can make this and that one works really well and you can give it year to year to all the new people and you never need to develop a new one. That one's pretty good. Now, what are they doing for this particular virus, this SARS-2 virus or COVID-19? They just started a clinical trial last week, which is amazing, with a vi- with a um, vaccine that's made of a lipid particle, nanoparticle with mRNA inside. So the mRNA, what that means is just the genetic material that the virus uses to infect, but they don't take the whole thing. They just take a little part of it, just the part that we develop antibodies to that protect us. So what they're doing is putting this one gene sequence into a lipid nanoparticle and then developing that as a vaccine. So what happens? You inject it into the muscle of a person and those dendritic cells eat it up. They take it to the lymph node. They present it. They think there's an infection. And so they generate the T cell responses. They generate the antibody responses just like you normally would, but it's just to a little tiny piece. Now, if you have got these lipid nanoparticles and this mRNA is really easy to make these, but we still have to do safety trials and efficacy trials, right? So you might hear about phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. So phase one is safety and dose. So they're just gonna take a bunch of people and inject them with different doses and make sure they don't get sick. There's nothing bad that happens. Then you have to do a phase two trial where you need to see if it actually works, right? Theoretically it works, but we don't really know until you test it, right? So you do a phase two trial and you test, does it work? And if it passes that gauntlet, then it goes on to a phase three trial. And in a phase two, three trial, there's a very large group of people who get the vaccine and they test it according to what's called the gold standard. Now, that would be if there already existed a vaccine and there doesn't. So I don't know exactly what they do in this. I think they do a phase two, phase three mixed trial in something like this because there's no gold standard to compare it to. So things get expedited a little bit. So I think that to know why is this going to take one to two years, it's because all of those things have to happen. We got really lucky. It could have taken a lot longer if we didn't already have comparable information from similar viruses, this SARS, for example, the original SARS virus, it's what's called a spike protein, the little, the little thing that sticks out the surface of the virus is what we make the antibodies to. And it's very, very similar between SARS and this SARS-2. So we were able to really rapidly say, that's, the, that's what we want to target. And then we take that and make the vaccine out of it. Is there any reason in particular why for the uh, COVID-19 they're going towards this nanoparticle style vaccine as opposed to the attenuated virus vaccine? I think one, it's faster. Attenuated vaccines take a really long time to make because basically what you have to do is you grow it in the lab over over and over and over and over and over and over until it accumulates enough mutations that it's really, really crappy at infecting a human. And so um, to develop those kinds of vaccines take years and years and years. And it's not a standard procedure. Um, We have a lot of vaccines on the market that are like that, but the newer vaccines that we're making usually don't employ that technique because it takes a long time. And it's probably safer using the nanoparticle-based vaccines as well. It, it It is very safe because there's no chance of it incorporating into your genome. There's no chance of it revert, what we call reverting. So if you have an attenuated vaccine, there's always a possibility that it could mutate again and become infectious. It's a concern when we talk about polio, but it usually does, it almost never happens basically, but it's still, it's a safety concern. So we don't do that as frequently now. Cool. So the last question that we have is there's been mention of the difference between the effects of COVID-19 in children versus older individuals. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about why this may be the case. Well, the bottom line is we don't really know. There's there's not enough studies done yet to entirely understand, one, the immune response to this virus, two, why it's causing death. We think we know that it's an over-exuberant immune response. Your immune system just goes crazy and attacks it and damages the lungs. But what we do know is that the, what we call comorbidities, so those are other diseases that people have already that make them significantly more susceptible to this infection or to death from this infection. Those are things like heart disease, COPD, diabetes, 
inflammatory diseases like this. So those individuals are more susceptible. Now, if you look at the population in general, who usually has those comorbidities, they're going to be the older people. So it could simply be that you're more susceptible when you're older because you're more likely to have these underlying diseases that make you more susceptible. However, we also know that as you age, your immune system doesn't work as well. So your cells get, for lack of a better way of saying it, tired out. You heal less quickly and you are more susceptible to infections. When you get vaccines, they don't work as effectively. So, you know, when we get the flu vaccine, there are actually two different ones, ones for older individuals that have a higher level of antigen in them so that they develop an immune response because they tend not to respond as well to vaccines. So, so we know all of those things, but I think what we really need to think about is the fact that by saying that older individuals are more susceptible to this, we are starting to ignore a little bit the problem that younger people really do get sick and they can die from this. So we don't want to ignore that fact. Everyone really needs to take this seriously. We can't just assume that younger kids are totally fine because they're not. And in fact, they might get infected and have this less severe uh, form of the disease and spread it even more. So, um, so we all have to really pay attention. So one last question that we have is there's been this idea that's been introduced, this idea of developing a herd immunity as a way to combat the COVID-19 spread. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and kind of the ideas behind that. So um, herd immunity is a great thing. It happens when a lot of people in a population are already resistant to an infection. And this could be because they've been previously infected and they have that memory or protective immune response, right? Or they received a vaccine, right? And they're resistant. The problem with what's going on right now is this is the first time humans have ever seen SARS-2, which is causing COVID-19. And so there's no pre-existing immunity in the population. And so there isn't any herd immunity. And so what people are talking about is, should we just infect a whole bunch of people and then they'll be resistant and then we'll all be good. The problem with that is that this is not without huge risk because every time you infect someone, you have the chance of it becoming very, very serious. Um, the numbers are not good about this. You know, 10 to 20% of individuals who get this are in the hospital. And so that's going to overwhelm our hospital. So Yes, herd immunity works, and I actually like to call it community immunity because it makes us all think like we're we're in this together, which we are. You know, we we were we all get vaccines so that we protect the whole population. But um, but this idea of trying to generate herd immunity on the go while we're combating an infection is is really reckless and dangerous. I think that's all I have. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Absolutely. Is there anything else? Uh, that you think would be worth mentioning? Just stay inside. <laughs> <laughs> Don't yeah. go out. Wash your hands. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Thank you very much. I Absolutely. won't take up any more of your time. All, All right. right. Take Bye. care. Stay yep, healthy. Too. Yep. Bye. Bye. So that is it for our three-part series on topics relating to the coronavirus. If you all missed the first two parts, you can find the links to those videos down below in the description. And with that, I will see you next time. Thank you.